Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you gave it for us and that you gave us your word so that we could understand you. We could understand so many things that are happening in the world today. And we ask that tonight our minds would be open and we could understand more about how we got that into our hands and we could fall in love with it all over again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, my name is Mike Peterson. Uh, for years, I'm just going to sit down here to kind of have a little, looks a little easier that way. Uh, for years, can you turn that, is that slide going to be up here or is it, there you go. Um, I actually uh, owned a company that produced Bibles and biblical reference tools for the industry and uh, then worked in ancient manuscripts as well, which was so fun. Um, and then I had a heart attack when I was 44, and uh, God spoke to me pretty clearly, you're going to shut this down, which was very confusing. Have you ever been in that saying, God, I'm producing Bibles for you, <laughs> like he really needed me. And, uh, and so I called over 18 years ago Tyndale Publishers because I so appreciated their heart and their integrity, and uh, says, could I stay in the Portland area? I know, who would want to stay in the Portland area? Uh, but I did, and they says, you know what? Our district manager of 30 plus years just retired. And so it was sort of a, a sign from God, go ahead, do this. And in the process, they allow me to do this, um, which is pretty amazing. When I had the company, I could never do this because we were so busy producing things, falling in love with it, but I could never talk. And so that's what I get to do tonight. And to start with, what I'd like to do, we can go to the next blank slide, please. I'd like to read a passage. Uh, to me, it's a critical passage. It was written by Peter, 2 Peter 1, 12 through 15. And Peter wrote this right at the end of his life. So you can assume it's going to have some incredibly important message. And listen to how often he uses the word remember. He says in here, Therefore I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you've been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. I love this part. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things well after I'm gone. Um, I think that's something that we forget. We forget as families to remember what's going on in our lives. It's certainly why God gave us communion because he knows we're a forgetful people. And so what I'm going to do tonight is some of you may already know these things and are standing firm in the truth you've been taught, but it's still good to remind uh, what's happening. And so that's what we're going to do. And in the future, we're talking about some pretty, pretty strong things. So welcome all tonight. And what I would like to do is sort of just give a, a quick history of how we got the Bible that we hold in our hands. And what I hope it does is gives us a whole new appreciation for God's Word and what people went through to get us what we have today. Um, in the process, uh, let's start back this could be a really long night. Let's start in 70 AD. Um, used to long nights. <laughs> used to long nights. Well, even reading that passage in Peter, wasn't it incredible? It, it, it is incredible to me to think about what they did in the first century church when they'd meet in homes or the churches. And all they would do was take these letters that are sent them. They'd be making copies of them, going from church to church to church, reading, and then discussing. What was this said? Could you imagine the excitement? Not to mention when Christ rose from the dead. Well, let's say when he was crucified. 
the graves opened up and people from the past came back to life and walked into the village. You can see in Matthew 27. Could you imagine if someone saw that? They'd be going, I'll lead a church. Just, I believe what's being said here. And lives were changed so radically that when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, we had just an incredible honeymoon going on with the church. The church was at a point that they'd do anything for the Lord and each other. And there was not really pastors, you'd say. There was bishops over the church. There was archbishops over the city. There was patriarchs over the community. And there was emperors who didn't like this thing at all. And so when Jerusalem fell for the next 250 years, which is a very long time, there were people that the emperors hated giving their authority to anybody else. They didn't like anybody worshiping a god more than they would worship them. And so they would say to people, unless you renounce your faith, you're going to die a death that you've never seen before. It's going to be some of the most brutal, disgusting deaths that there are. All you have to do is renounce your faith. And they refused. There was death after death, and Christianity grew and grew and grew. To the point that by 300 AD, people were volunteering, which certainly defeated the purpose of these emperors. If they're going, renounce your faith, and people go, no, choose me, I'd like to die for the Lord. And so they did. And since it was ruining everything they were planning, they declared in 312 AD what's called an act of toleration. An act of toleration is just what it says. OK, you guys, um, we're not saying you win. But we are going to say that we're going to tolerate you. And from now on, you can't proselytize. You can't keep sharing your faith. But you can be Christians. You can go around and do that. And so we've got that. And so while these emperors are making heroes of Christians, we've gone from a point when people were praying. They were fervently praying to God every day for his substance. And now all of a sudden, it's OK to be a Christian. And then during the same time, there was an emperor that you've probably heard of called Constantine. Constantine was in sort of a civil war with another Roman emperor by the name of Maxentius. Maxentius had this huge army. And Constantine knew he had no hopes. But he one day had a vision, and he saw the cross. And it says, by this sign, conquer. And so he thought, oh, this must be Christianity. So he put the cross on his guys, and guess what? Lo and behold, they defeated Maxentius and his armies. And so now all of a sudden, we have Christianity, which was powerful because of prayer. Now all of a sudden, it's tolerated. And lo and behold, now it's pretty cool. So now that it's cool to be a Christian, we're going to start seeing some things that happen within Christianity. You'll find during persecution, Christianity explodes. Yes. That during easy times, we struggle. And it's been that way throughout history. And so we can go to the next slide. In, uh, in about 390, uh, during this time of captivity, uh, one thing that did happen was, since the Romans had power, Greek was no longer the language of the day. It now changed to Latin. And a lot of Latin manuscripts started coming out that were not good. And so this bishop, he liked to be called the Pope Damasus, who was basically had a, a theological advisor by the name of Jerome. Jerome was actually a Syrian hermit uh, who knew Greek very well. And so he took it on himself to learn Hebrew. And he put all the scriptures together and created what was called the Latin Vulgate. That was in 390. The Latin Vulgate meaning it's just a vulgar text. 
What's amazing about that is it lasted for the next thousand years. That was the Bible. We can go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, I should go back. It should be a blank. There we go. Um, I want to go now after Constantine. Now we've got the Bible. And Constantine, when he passed away, a couple leaders later, a couple emperors, you will find that they, we've gone from tolerating Christianity to it being pretty cool. And then there's a guy named Theodosius, who now made it illegal not to be a Christian. Probably one of the worst things that could happen. Because now you're in a position, no matter what you do, I'm a Christian. That's just how it is right now. And so it became that way. What became worse is as time went on, by the 500s, Rome had fallen. And Latin was no longer the language of the day. It was only the language of the very learned people, the people that were very bright in high places. Very few people could read alone, saying Latin, who now people didn't even understand. And so with that happening in the 500s, there became an incredible battle between the popes and the emperors. Um, and we'll find out. I, I'm not going to go through all the, the men that God obviously used through this process. I would say one of the greatest miracles through this time is that God preserved his word absolutely perfectly through this time. Because you will find that emperors will leave it to their son. And popes ended up... Now, some people may think I'm really getting on the Catholic Church here. I'm not. I'm getting on humanity. This is who we are. You'll find that absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a true statement. And what you'll find out now is that the popes began using these kings. They would be hired muscle. They had all this religious leading, and so people had to follow them, but they didn't have any might. And so they would hire these guys that you would hear their names. But I'm going to go all the way to Charlemagne in the 800s, who is a good guy. But when he died, he did something you never do. You leave the entire kingdom to all your kids. And it became a battle. There was a war going on. So it's where we started the lords and the serfs, feudalism. Uh, the most interesting thing is called, it was simony. Simony was basically, you could, they would set up a, a list of all the sins they could think of. And it would continually grow as they thought of a new sin. And they would put a price tag on it. And so that you could pay now for the sins you were going to commit. And because nobody understood Latin, this is how bad it got. Let's say, for instance, let's say that uh, uh, Bill was the emperor. And he thought, you know, I... I've got this power, he's a believer, he knows these things, and I'm his brother-in-law who doesn't have a job, but I'm educated because I'm part of that royal line. And he says, I'm going to make you archbishop. So here I am, not having any clue who the Lord is, but I'm a Christian because you have to be a Christian. And he says, you are this. Well, as people got into those power positions that didn't know Christ, there were some wonderful people, but the outspoken ones were the ones that caused all the problems. And those are the ones that would start changing what words meant in Scripture so that they could do things like simony, so that they could say, no, Scripture says, I know you don't understand it, just trust me. We're not going to put the Bible in any language that you understand. We're going to keep it in Latin. And we're going to be able to tell you what it means. And they did. And so they began collecting money that you would not believe. And it got so bad that in 1000 AD, there was a guy who was Pope Gregory VII, got in a fight with Henry IV. And they were in such a fight, saying basically to each other, you don't have any control over me. 
And it got so bad that finally, uh, Gregory VII declared what was called an interdiction on this king's whole territory. Well, an interdiction was basically saying, none of your people in your area, no priest can give communion. To put that in perspective, communion was the only way they said, your sins are forgiven. So because of that now, this king's entire country was sentenced to hell. And there was nothing they could do about it because they didn't understand Latin anyway. This is what you'd say. That's how bad it got. Until, we can go to the next slide, there's a gentleman by the name of John Whitcliffe. I uh, love this guy. Uh, he was a professor at Oxford. And during his time at Oxford, which is in the later 1300s, he was reading the Latin Vulgate. They had three copies of it at Oxford University at that time. And when he was reading it, he started going, wait a minute. This isn't saying what you're saying it's saying. And so his statement was, I'm going to put it into English. That did not sit well with anybody there. And so uh, I will say, this here is uh, a copy of the uh, Wycliffe Bible. And you're welcome to come up and see it afterwards. If you can read it, I'll be very impressed. <laughs> uh, even though it's English, remember it's scribed, so it's handwritten. Um, it, if you do start pronouncing it, you're going to sound like the Swedish chef. It just has that kind of, I don't understand it, type thing. But he was able to do it. People absolutely hated him. I was going to actually bring my original of this, but I don't have one. <clears throat> so Wycliffe, to show uh, they never, ever convicted him of any crime. They hated him. They excommunicated him from the church. He finished the Bible. And this shows what bitterness does. Um, he was buried in 41 years. Can you sense the ire that was building up in these people because he put the Bible in English? Um, 41 years after he died, they dug up his bones and crushed them and threw them in the river so that no one would ever remember him again. What a successful ploy that was. Here we are talking about him today. Um, so that is what happened. Though When he came out with it, this is what I think we have to look at as a nation, as the world. Even though he's the one that was the major part of the translation team, and it was called the Wycliffe Bible, they decided to destroy as many as they could. But there was a guy up in Prague area, it's called Bohemia, you can go to the next slide, by the name of Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a college guy, and he got a hold of this translation, and he got a hold of a lot of students, and it revolutionized their lives. They started a movement that wasn't going to be stopped, uh, and the church did not like it at all. And so they got a hold of Jan Hus. Actually, it was an emperor called Zygismund. I just use these names because it makes me sound so intelligent. Actually, I use them because it took me so long to memorize them. And Zygismund uh, said, would you come and share with the church council what you're saying? Because it's just amazing all the lives that are changed. And Hus said, of course I won't do that. You'll have me killed. And Zygismund says, I am the emperor you will not be harmed. So he went to the church council. And as soon as he shared his story, they said, that's blasphemy. We're going to kill you. And what's amazing is um, this book uh, I located, it was translated into English in 1933. But it's a journal from a guy named Popius the Papist. Isn't that a great name? Um, it's called Hus the Heretic. This guy's job was to go get Hus, take him to the church council, and keep a log of everything that happened. So this is actually a journal of everything that happened during the trials 
of Jan Hus. And Jan Hus was put in a prison where we don't, wouldn't recognize it today. Uh, the salt water would come up and get in there um, so that his teeth fell out. When his teeth fell out, he could no longer bite his nails, so his nails grew to extraordinary lengths, and he was very sick. And when they decided to, to kill him, he made some statements saying, within the next hundred years, the Spirit of God is going to move so hard that there's nothing you can do to stop it. Wow. Um, and then what's cool is when they went to burn him at the stake, they couldn't get it lit. They kept trying and trying and trying, and he finally died of smoke inhalation. And the minute he died, the flames came and consumed his body. It was an amazing thing with Jan Hus. We can go to the, the next slide now. So with Jan Hus, um, now all of a sudden, we're in a position where we have the need for the Reformation. And so we're moving forward. We've got the 30, we've got this Bible. We've got all of a sudden a position where he says, we, uh, when Hus was killed, they declared martial law. Martial law saying that anybody that's caught with a Wycliffe Bible will be put to death and their entire family. Uh, one of the things I was able to work on um, was this collection of manuscripts. And so you know, we would do our very best to get these manuscripts into collectors' hands that would allow scholars and people to see these manuscripts. One of those was this one. Um, you can put the next slide. It was actually a Wycliffe Bible that's covered in blood. That absolutely changed me. When I saw that, I asked, I videotaped this, so I took this off a of video. But somebody didn't care. Somebody had the word of God in their hands and determined it didn't matter. It was better to have God's word than your life. I can't wait to ask that person in glory, who are you? Who was it that did that? What an incredible thing that that would happen. Next slide. We're going to move forward now to the 1500s, so we can get through this. We can ask questions, too. What I'm doing here is kind of showing the whole process of translation. Now it's going to move a lot quicker in time, because in 1516, this gentleman by the name of Erasmus, who is an incredible Greek scholar, um, he was an illegitimate child from a priest, uh, but he found all the manuscripts that he could locate what was called the Byzantium Empire. Today it's Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, it was also Constantinople. He got everything he could find and created a Greek text of the Bible. And in that Greek text, we call it his fifth and sixth editions, we call the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. Uh, it's an incredible work. Next slide. Um, with that, there was one change. Is there a slide in between these, or is that the, was that the next one? Um, William Tyndale, we'll just go this way. William Tyndale was another genius at the same time as Martin Luther. Um, they took Erasmus's text. His first one is 1516. His second edition was 1518. That's the one Martin Luther used to create the German the first Bible in German. Um, and it's the one that basically started the Reformation. When, uh, you know, Martin Luther put these 95 questions uh, that were stuck on the Wittenberg, the Wittenberg, it was a church, a door, that he wanted to have a discussion with the leadership. Well, somebody took them down and printed them. And that was the difference between when Wycliffe wanted to print the Bible, everybody had to use handwritten. Now when Tyndale says I want to do it, what's the difference? There was one invention, the printing press. Uh, Gutenberg had done the printing press. So now when William Tyndale 
decided he wanted to do a translation into English, it was scary. Um, and they didn't like it at all. And in fact, in one meeting, when there's a group of scholars there, um, they stood up and they says, we do not need the Bible in our language as long as we have the Pope to tell us what it means. Um, and he stood up and said, I defy the Pope and all of his laws. And this is the strongest statement I can imagine anybody making. He says, and if the Lord allows me to live long enough, the boy that runs the plow will know more of scripture than you do. What a statement. Could you imagine talking to scholars and saying, if the Lord allows me to live long enough, the boy that runs a plow is going to know more of scripture than you do. Because they would say God spoke to the apostles in their language. When the Bible was printed, the Old Testament, what was it in? It was in Hebrew. Because... People spoke Hebrew. The New Testament in the Koine Greek, uh, in Aramaic, God loves language. He loves people to understand his word. And we as people did our best to destroy that. And God protected it through all this time, which we can find by things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, which how did you keep it that accurate? through time. So now we're in a position that William Tyndale says, I'm going to do it in English. And they started chasing him. They chased him everywhere as he started translating. He translated the New Testament. Um, and he finished that in 1525. And one gentleman purchased almost all of them and had them burnt so that nobody could read them. Uh, the problem was that he purchased all of them. So the now Tyndale had an incredible amount of funds to retranslate. And he has a second one in 1526. Um, you can come see this. This is uh, it's an incredible piece of work. And in fact, if you learn about William Tyndale, who I think I mentioned knew eight languages fluently, it was William Shakespeare that learned how to write from William Tyndale. William Tyndale made up words. The word beautiful, the word mercy seat, the word scapegoat, they never existed before William Tyndale, who loved language, would put those together so that we would have an understanding of what was being said. Well, he started working on the Old Testament, got a lot of it accomplished, and then somebody set up a guy into his group, and he was arrested in 1535. In 1535, he was put in prison. And we actually have a letter from him in prison. And that letter, in essence, says, it is terribly cold down here. Uh, could I get my hat and coat? But of most importance, could I continue getting my study material so I can continue to work? We don't know if he ever got it. We don't have a clue. Could you go to the next slide? Um, but what we do know is that in 1536, uh, William Tyndale was strangled and burnt at the stake using his New Testaments, his Bibles as kindling. Uh, his final words, and these are significant, were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. That was Tyndale's final words, and the King of England was Henry VIII, who was not known to be very kind. Uh, well, here's what's astounding. When I had the company, at, at one time, uh, uh, I got a phone call from a lady who says, I have a 1537 Matthews Bible. Well, the Matthews Bible was all of Tyndale's workers continued working on the text. He was killed. He was martyred 1526 in October, 1536, 1537, a year later. They come out with the entire Bible. They call it the Matthews Bible. When this lady called me, she said, I have an original copy. I'd like to make a real facsimile copy of it so it looks just like the original. So our company took it. We began working on it. It took us six months to get it looking. She had it professionally unbound. It took us six months to get it perfect so that we could go to press. 
But what stood out to me, I don't know if you can see the title page there, it's kind of hard. That is the title page to that Matthew's Bible. And at the bottom, it says on the title page, set forth with the king's most gracious license. Remember his final words? It was, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. Guess who gave the approval for this Bible? King Henry VIII, the king of England. So less than a year after Tyndale is martyred, God answers his prayer, and we have the Matthews Bible. Um, it was a hard time, but we finished the Bible in about six months to create one, which um, there is one here. But um, I called the lady the day we were done, and that morning she had committed suicide. So uh, we had the original manuscript. No one even knew we had it. Um, so I sold it on eBay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't. Um, we, we got it back to her family. Um, it took a year and a half. It's a long story, but it made us sad that here's somebody, we don't know the reason to this day, but finally Hendrickson Publishers um, called and they said, we'd like to do the Matthews Bible. So this is a copy of that Matthews Bible. That was 1537. Want to go to the next slide? That was the beginning of something that nobody could stop now. We began doing a lot of different Bibles. The next one I think of super significance is what we call the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was done in 1560. It was the very first Bible with verses all the way through. It is also called the Pilgrim's Bible, because it's the one the pilgrims brought over, as well as the one that our Constitution is based off of. Um, it is an amazing manuscript. And then one that we're certainly all familiar with is 1611, the King James Bible. The King James Bible, uh, the first edition was actually called the He Bible. It was called the He Bible because in Ruth 3.15 it said he instead of she. So they called it the He Bible. When they made the correction, it was the She Bible. They called it the She Bible. We do that. You know, we have, uh, we have one called the Vinegar Bible because it said vinegar instead of vineyard. The most famous one, and they have, if you ever heard of the Museum of the Bible, which is in Washington, D.C., if you ever get a chance, go there. They have every biblical manuscript you can imagine. And if you want to see the whole thing, it's free. It would take you eight days. Um, and it is astounding. But they have what's called the Wicked Bible. The Wicked Bible was, actually, they left out one word um, in the Ten Commandments that said, thou shalt commit adultery. They left out not. Um, the printer, his whole career was ruined with that one. And they think it was a purposeful mistake. So all of them were destroyed, but there are seven known in existence. And the Museum of the Bible has two of them. So that from that, we can go on to the next slide. I think. We'll go to the next slide. There's no more. OK. Then I'll tell you what the next one was. Um, it basically talks about all the translations we have today. What we have fallen into the pit to me is you can walk into a Christian bookstore and when you walk in, it's completely full of these Bibles and it's overwhelming when you see these. The sad part about that is they took a poll not that many years ago and found out that 50% of people that walk into a store to buy a Bible leave without one because they were overwhelmed. My goal, and I hope the goal of everybody here, is we completely change that. We change that so that when we walk in, we see those Bibles and become overwhelmed that we are able to have that many Bibles available to us because we don't know how long that will be. Um, 
And so we're in a position now that we do have a number of translations. Maybe too many to count. Um, but let me put it this way. Uh, when I speak to pastors' conferences, the number one question I get is, what is the most accurate translation? Um, and my response is always the same. Uh, I say, I have no idea. And then I say, neither do you. Because words denote meaning. So it's the readers. Now, I always come back and say, actually, I do know the most accurate translation. It's the one you're reading. Because if you're reading it, the Holy Spirit will do everything with it. If you're not reading it, the Holy Spirit will do nothing with it. There is nothing there to use. So that is the most accurate translation, is the one you're reading. I have favorites. We all do. But I'm not ever going to pretend that it's the most accurate one. Um, and I sell Bibles. <laughs> so today we have probably three major types. We have paraphrases. Paraphrases, I will always say, are when an individual writes something. Uh, Ken Taylor did the Living Bible. Um, outstanding, sold over 40 million. And how many people during the Jesus movement came to Christ reading the way? You know, and these things that you're going, where did that come from? Um, then there's the message. Eugene Peterson did a phenomenal job of going through. We're not calling it a translation. We're calling it a paraphrase. A gentleman's ability or somebody's ability to sit down and say, God, how can I best say this so that people can worship you as they read it? Then we have what's called a literal translation. A literal translation, there are many of them, and they're basically taking verse by verse by verse. They're not taking word by word. Nobody can do that. You couldn't do it with any language. If you try to go word by word with any language, it's not going to make any sense. If any of you have taken Spanish or French or anything, it doesn't work that way. But they do take a verse, and they will make it that literal to each one. And for studying, that is tremendous. That would be King James, New King James, ESV, New American Standard. There's a number of them that are tremendous literal translations. The other thing that's great about a literal translation is they're written in a cadence. Uh, the King James, how easy it is to memorize because it's written almost poetically. It's in that cadence sound so you can memorize. The problem is, of course, we've turned into people that read in nuggets, that memorize in nuggets and don't get the whole picture. So then there's what's called the formal translation um, or dynamic translation. Uh, it, the dynamic translation is one that they take the passage and they translate it based on that entire passage. Um, and with that done, you can say, that's probably the one that takes the most work because, uh, for instance, I would say the NLT, the NIV somewhat, not as much anymore, but the, let's say the NLT took uh, 96 scholars 24 years with the original languages to get it that understandable. Um, and that takes a lot of work. And when you say these guys using the original languages, they are using the original languages. <laughs> and they're using everything that's available to them. So when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, translators went to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they began saying, how does this compare with what we have? Uh, so today, I am not one of those, again, that's going to put down a translation. Um, God does that, by the way. God has... And I kind of love it. When we had produced Bibles, one time with Oxford, they sent us a, a Bible called the Feminist Bible. And it said, Our Mother, Father, which art in heaven. And I took it and I said, you know, this, this isn't what it says. Um, and but what happened was they sold about 500 copies and spent over a million dollars. So I'm saying, thank you, Lord. 
We don't have to take care of those things. God is the master of his word. And no matter what we do, we're not going to be the ones that are going to say, now we can certainly say to somebody, ah, careful. Um, but watch what God does, the process, and how he uses translation. So with that said, I hope we have an understanding more of how we got the word we have today. What I would love to see sometime, and I hope this um, does happen, I'd be happy to work with you on it, is let's get some of these Bibles. Let's get a, all these are available by the company we just purchased, and put them in a display case, and put the story behind each one of what happened. Oh, there it is, um, different Bibles. But have a statement in front of each one basically saying, this person gave their life, this happened here. And right at the end, have a little arrow pointing to your Bibles and say, because of these, we have these. So that people now come in and not only say, I want a Bible to read, but when Peter says, remember, maybe I want one of these so that my family can remember what people went through so that we have this one. The biggest impact now that we're going to deal with is I can get people, maybe, as we talk about things, for people to fall in love with what they're holding. 